2021 has been a pretty fantastic year for movies, with a vast variety of films for all cinema goers, from giant blockbusters to intimate character studies to ineffable, wildly eccentric films. But this list of 15 are the ones that have stuck with me the most. Films that met my own artistic sensibilities and tastes and found a way to leave an impact on me within this crazy year. Overall, I saw around 150 new releases, but of course, there will be films I omit that you may love, either because A, I didn't see them, or B, they just didn't connect with me. But do share with me the films that you loved this year. I'd love to see everyone's list. Without further ado, let's get started with some honorable mentions that didn't quite crack my top 15. Wes Anderson's The French Dispatch, Ryosuke Hamaguchi's Wheel of Fortune and Fantasy, Theo Anthony's All Light Everywhere, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley, Kira Kovalenko's Unclenching the Fists, and Paolo Sorrentino's The Hand of God. David Lowry's brilliant rumination on the frailties of heroism is a beguiling subversion of classic chivalric fables. It's not your typical fantasy film at all, as Lowry's intimate, contemplative style makes for a film that is less concerned with grand adventure and action, and more interested in crafting a dreamlike odyssey about the inevitability of death. On top of that, it's a technical marvel, with some of the most stunning hallucinatory imagery and compositions that look straight out of a painting. While The Green Knight doesn't quite reach the emotional or thematic heights of Lowry's other work, like A Ghost Story or Ain't Them Body Saints, it does instead deliver a rare sense of grandeur within the viewer, something that seems increasingly hard to accomplish as cinema evolves. And yet, David Lowry pulled it off with only 15 million. Jane Campion's The Power of the Dog is a film that I didn't gel with upon first viewing. Maybe it was because it wasn't exactly what I was expecting going in, or maybe it was that I just didn't find the slow burn rewarding. However, with every subsequent rewatch, I found so much to love here. Campion has crafted a nuanced tale about the destructive nature of repression and the intrigue of shifting power dynamics, all found within a stunning western landscape. It's a film that takes time to reveal itself, gradually unfurling until you realize what its true implications are. Because of this, it's a film that demands several rewatches. You want to go back and catch every subtle gesture or minute detail that can't be a sprinkle throughout. Furthermore, she has imbued nearly every scene with this tangible psychosexual tension, whether it be through Johnny Greenwood's ominous score or Ari Wagner's isolated camera. Both of their brilliant work here adds so many layers to the experience, and the film surely wouldn't have packed as big of a punch without it. While it took me a while to get on Campion's wavelength with this one, once you look beyond its cold facade and grow to understand the pacing and structure, The Power of the Dog makes for a haunting and gripping watch, one that has immense staying power. The films of Mia Hansen love are always so gentle and deeply personal, and her love letter to Ingmar Bergman and storytelling is no different. Bergman Island is a deceptively simple film, starting out as an unassuming movie about two artists on the island of Faro but its ornate ideas begin to rise to the surface when the film starts to oscillate between fantasy and reality. Observing the relationship between cinema and the real world and how the line between the two can easily begin to blur. It's also a film that's completely unafraid to go meta as it draws ideas from Bergman's Scenes from a Marriage. But Haunts and Love ensures that the meta-textualness of it all never goes overboard to the point where it becomes a riff on Bergman. Instead, she makes a film that is a self-reflexive ode to finding inspiration as an artist simply using Bergman and the island of Faro as a vehicle for its themes. I always love plunging into the works of Mia Hansen Love, and Bergman Island is one that I will surely be revisiting numerous times. The work of Paul Verhoeven has always been controversial, and Benedetta follows that pattern. This time around, though, he critiques Catholicism through the story of two lesbian nuns in a 17th century convent. It's a delightfully vulgar and wickedly entertaining affair that is unapologetically Verhoeven, from its brazen depictions of sex and nudity to its unabashed theatricality. But as a Verhoeven superfan, I found Benedetta to be a blast to watch, as it's everything you go to one of his films for. Sure, it's not quite as thematically rich as something like Elle, but it remains gripping throughout as you await to see what strange religious imagery and provocations Verhoeven has up his sleeve. Benedetta surely won't create any new Verhoeven fans, but for those who love to indulge in his style, I think you will, like me, walk away incredibly entertained. Leos Carax's wildly eccentric musical Annette is one of the most ambitious films I've seen in a very long time that somehow manages to outweird even Holy Motors. 
It's this bizarre, surrealistic fever dream of a film in which the boundless imagination of Carax is on full display. But it's also a film that actually has something interesting to say, because when looking beyond the myriad of eccentricities, like Baby Annette and the Cunnilingus musical number, you will find an incredibly tragic exploration of fame and ego, and a heart-wrenching tribute to children who were forced to grow up too fast. Carax also pulls out some career-best work from Driver and Cotillard, who are willing to go to insane places to pull off the visions of both Carax and the Sparks Brothers. On top of that, the music rocks, and once again the playful fantasies of Carax are simply unparalleled. Annette is one of those films that doesn't give a shit if you're on board with it or not. It takes bold swings that will excite some and irritate others, but personally, I ate up every second and loved seeing one of the world's greatest living directors go absolutely hog wild. When pressing play on Procession, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had no clue that what I was about to experience would be the most vital piece of filmmaking of the year. Procession follows a group of men that have been sexually abused by Catholic priests and clergy, and are seeking to find some semblance of healing by partaking in drama therapy. Filmmaker Robert Greene, who continues his exploration of nonfiction meshed with dramatic reenactment, frames the stories of these six men by restaging their traumatic experiences through short films that each one of them create. It makes for an utterly cathartic film that shows the power art has to heal, to allow those crippled by their past, free themselves of their traumas, and share it with those who may carry that same pain. Procession is not an easy watch by any means, but it's an important one. Not only for its immensely moving nature, but also to experience the ways in which it elevates the documentary form. I'm in awe of the resiliency of each of these men, and I'm so glad that Green was able to give them a safe space to finally tell their stories. So much has already been said about this gargantuan film, but like everyone else, I was completely floored by Denis Villeneuve's Dune. It's easily some of the most awe-inspiring blockbuster filmmaking I've ever seen, as Denis exquisitely translates the dense world of Frank Herbert's novel to the big screen bringing to life the political warfare, ecological destruction, sandworms, and spice of Herbert's novel in truly breathtaking ways. The sheer amount of skill on display here is astounding as well, as Denis, cinematographer Greg Frazier, production designer Patrice Vermette, and so many others work together to build this tangible, wildly immersive, and fully realized world. But building this sense of operatic spectacle clearly isn't Denis' sole focus, as there are so many intimate character moments that ensure the world, regardless of how stunning it is, doesn't feel hollow. So often, science fiction epics fall right into those trappings, but Dune doesn't, and it makes for a film as equally engrossing as it is bombastic. It's truly invigorating blockbuster filmmaking that has me so excited to see what Denis has in store for us in part two. Sean Baker's latest, Red Rocket, Simon Rex plays what is most likely the most fascinating character of the year in Mikey Saber, a washed-up porn star who moves back to his hometown subjecting those around him to his woefully narcissistic behavior. This is a man whose every action is completely self-serving, a man who is an artifact of a bygone era and continues to ride off the high of that nostalgia. Mikey Saber is a deeply reprehensible character, yet it's impossible to look away from him, as Rex plays Saber with a charisma and energy that allows us into the humanity of his character. I think that in the hands of less empathetic artists, Saber's plight could have felt like meaningless poverty porn, but with Sean Baker at the helm, he as he's done in his past films, seeks to delve deep into the rejects of American society and attempt to understand what makes, in the case of Red Rocket, a sleazy manipulator do these particular things. Baker consistently opens up a window into sides of the human experience that are often cast aside and ignored. Red Rocket effectively does just that, while also delivering an overall entertaining and beautifully constructed film. Like so many others, Michael Sarnowski's debut feature was quite easily the biggest surprise of the year for me. I mean, who would have thought that the Nick Cage and Truffle Hunting Pig film would have been one of the most intelligent and empathetic meditations on grief we'd get this year? Pig is a film that deconstructs the revenge genre in incredibly fascinating ways, delivering a film almost entirely void of the violence and catharsis you'd find throughout the genre, and instead giving us a film about the possibilities of grace and closure when seeking vengeance. Nicolas Cage has never been better in a performance that showcases his quiet and mournful side that oftentimes goes unnoticed. It's a challenging performance with all of its subtleties, but Cage reminds us all of the powerhouse performer he can be when paired with the right material. The sheer level of restraint Sarnowski displays in his filmmaking here is genuinely astounding, 
and the fact that this is a debut feature makes it all the more impressive. Bravo, Mr. Sarnowski. The Matrix Resurrections is not your traditional blockbuster sequel. It's a film that's not satisfied with simply playing into nostalgia or playing into every fan's wet dream to make a quick buck. Instead, it seeks to act as the antithesis to the cold, emotionalist tentpole films Hollywood has pumped out over the years. With Matrix Resurrections, Lana Wachowski harkens back to the humanist roots of the franchise, delivering an earnest observation of grief, trauma, and love through the lens of this vast science fiction universe. At a time when blockbuster cinema continues to fall into the same trappings of empty fan service and impersonal stories and characters, Resurrections is here to remind us the heights that tentpole cinema can reach, that a compelling story doesn't have to be at the expense of grandiose scale and awe-inspiring action, but that both can work in harmony to enhance the emotions and themes on display. This is very clearly a personal film for Lana, and to see her get to make this with seemingly no restraint from higher powers was joyous. We desperately need more films like this one. Ever since watching Ryosuke Hamaguchi's film Happy Hour, I have been enamored by his restrained, almost purely conversational method of storytelling. The mundanity of his conversations, the subdued nature of his characters, the striking inexpressiveness of his camera, all of it draws me in in a way that very few filmmakers can manage to accomplish. His films evoke feelings in me that I find incredibly hard to put into words. But with Drive My Car, Hamaguchi has crafted one of the most singular depictions of grief, as he slowly peels away at his many painful layers. We, as an audience, bear witness to words failing as a mode of communication, and see his characters hide their emotions behind a wall of stoicism. With Hamaguchi finding a way to craft a story about connection and mourning beyond the use of words. This makes for an incredibly soft-spoken film that many will find monotonous in its slow build-up. But the payoff is cathartic. In my mind, Drive My Car is Hamaguchi's style reaching brand new heights, and I'm so excited to see where he'll go from here. Teton is one of those films that sneaks up on you in unexpected ways. Because walking in, I was expecting a wholly nightmarish and grotesque film that revels in its shock value. And while you do get that in moments, I found that beneath its provocative exterior, there's a tender, periodically funny, and emotionally resonant film about unconditional love and gender fluidity. Ducarneau, as she did with her previous film Raw, pushes beyond the boundaries of genre and seeks for her films to not become yet another empty, shock value horror film. Rather, her moments of autoerotica and body horror in this film, while they will undoubtedly elicit a visceral reaction from you, the viewer, they also feel important to understanding Ducarno's characters and the spectrum of emotions that they experience throughout the film. Agatha Rizal and Vincent Lindon bring life to these ideas beautifully, exuding such raw physicality and tenderness throughout the film. They ground a movie that definitely wouldn't hit as hard without their 100% dedication, but they gave it their all in every frame, and it fully pays off. With Titan, Julia Ducarneau has solidified herself as one of the most refreshing voices in cinema today, and I have no doubt that she will only continue to blow us away with her future work. Mike Mills has destroyed me yet again with Come On, Come On, an achingly beautiful portrait of people and the human experience, with an astoundingly nuanced Joaquin Phoenix performance at its center. Come On, Come On, as with every Mike Mills film that has come before it, is brimming with warmth and soul, and is completely void of the cynicism we can find in cinema today. It seeks to find the beauty in the mundane, the catharsis of the everyday, as Mills allows the audience to ruminate on their own small, fleeting moments that may have seemed trivial to them in the moment, but are now memories that they hold on to deeply, and try to not let them escape them as they grow older. It's that fear of forgetting and the inescapable dread that comes with its inevitability that Mills so profoundly touches on here. And there's truly no other filmmaker out there that I think could capture these feelings in the ways in which he does. Mike Mills is one special filmmaker, and Come On, Come On might just be his best work yet. Six years after the release of Cemetery of Splendor, Abby Shapong has returned with Memoria, his first film set outside of his native country, Thailand. Memoria is this slow, unfurling mystery that intertwines the natural with the supernatural, observing life amidst the palpable presence of a spiritual phenomena. The film is a ghost story of sorts, one in which humanity senses remnants of those perished through the eternal histories of Earth. It's a truly meditative experience that utilizes sound and space in wholly unique ways. Api Shapong's blocking and camera movements continue to feel so incredibly deliberate 
yet so natural, with his camera maintaining a pensive distance from his subjects and each lingering composition paralyzing you with its stillness. This is not a film that everyone will take to. Some will find it empty and boring, but those who love slow cinema like myself will have themselves a pseudo-religious experience with this one, especially during that transcendent final half hour. Memoria is truly a singular film experience, and I really hope Happy Shapong understands just how much his work means to people and the art form in general. I've already made a video on why this film is my favorite of the year, so I'll keep this brief and say that The Worst Person in the World is simply one of those rare films that manages to pull every single emotion out of you. It's this sweet and gentle, hilarious and weird, profound and relatable film that only someone like Joachim Trier could make. This is the kind of film that brings me back to why I fell in love with this art form in the first place, reminding me of the self-reflexive vessel that cinema can be, and the ways in which it puts up a mirror to the best and worst aspects of ourselves. The Worst Person in the World is quite easily my favorite film of 2021, and a movie that now holds a special place in my heart. That was my top 15 of 2021. As I mentioned in the intro, please write below some of your favorite films of the year. And also, give me some of your most anticipated films for next year. 2022 is uh, shaping up to be an even better year for film, with some renowned directors making their return. I'm so excited for what 2022 holds in terms of cinema, but for now, this has been The Film Loner. Thanks for watching. <laughs>